Welcome back. This is Chris, my brother Stephen. Hello. The date today is November 1st, year of our Savior 2016. Yeah. Bible study number 121. Yes. Bible study number 121. The title of this is going to be the Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord is referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right. So we're talking about saints and tribulation. Before the second coming of Christ, you're going to see the, the you're going to see tribulation. Now the futurists are fond of claiming that the various beasts um, or creatures spoken of in the Book of Revelation are representative of the Antichrist. The Antichrist, they say, will rule the world during the future <coughs> tribulation. However, the visions of Daniel clearly identify the beasts as representing nations that would rise to power. The beasts have already ruled the world, okay, in a succession of empires for over 2,500 years. And those empires would be, um, the first beast would be um, Babylon, then you have Medo-Persia, then you would have Greece, and of course you have the Roman Empire, uh, Pagan Empire, and then we get into the Papal Empire, which is the, the papacy, which is the little horn. Um, and that will be covered into, in 1 Thessalonians, we're going to be talking about the man of sin, the son of perdition, okay? And the only other time that's mentioned, the son of perdition, perdition is in reference to Judas Iscariot, yes. So we see that um, there has been uh, tribulation for the saints for 2,500 years as millions of believers have died for their faith. We're just going to discount all that. Okay. The notion that Christians will not have to face the tribulation is foreign to the scriptures. The pre tribulation rapture fantasy is an attempt to mm -hmm. escape the responsibilities given to the saints of God. That's exactly right. It is not merely an insignificant error of interpretation, but a satanic delusion that is designed to pacify and disarm the saints into their own slavery. They're like, oh, I don't care. You know, I just go there Sunday and I just listen to my pastor and look at the time because I can't wait to get my, you know, ham sandwich at the smorgasbord or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, that's it. You know, just make your church a big playground type of thing. So we're seeing here that Bible speaks of the beast at, yeah, football, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, sports, circus, now the, uh, basketball, whatever. The Bible speaks of the beast and Antichrist who were to deceive the very elect. Matthew 24, 24 is a reference to that, okay? So we see here that uh, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So we have a great deception coming at the very, uh, very end. It keeps amping up, okay? It's been going on for a very long time and it amps up at the very end, just before the second coming of Christ. Now we see here, Daniel beheld the little horn warring against the saints, and he prevailed against them, Daniel 7, 21. Daniel 7, 21, until the time came for the saints to take the kingdom from him. Okay, so Daniel 7, 25 to 27, we see, um, I'm going to have my brother Stephen read Daniel 7, 25 through 27. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, and a times, and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall, shall serve and obey. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cotigations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Okay. So we see that in the middle of these beasts, we have the saints of the Most High. You have the stone kingdom coming forth. 
And so we see the ending of, we talked about, we're talking about the fourth uh, beast shall come forth upon the earth. And it had 10 kingdoms, okay? And then out of the 10 kingdoms, you see a little horn. And that little horn is the papacy. We're going to get into that a little bit more. Now, it is our responsibility uh, and destiny to prevail against the worldly kingdom of the Antichrist. We shall prevail by obedience to the word of God. Now, it's interesting here is that it says right here in Daniel 7, as he was talking about verse 14, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall be not be destroyed. And verse 13 talks about one like the son of man come with the clouds. Now, when Jesus was taken up, when the disciples were watching him taken up, what was he taking up in? He was taken up in clouds, was he not? And they watched up, watched, and he had the angels, and they're like, well, what are you guys doing? And they're like, and he goes, just remember that the Son of Man, the Son of Man, will return with clouds. And when he comes, he's coming with all his glory, is what he's doing. And that's when he's going to remove all the wickedness from his kingdom, which is on coming from heaven to earth, okay? Now, we see where is the kingdom? The kingdom of God is on the earth. Jesus taught a number of parables that deal with the kingdom of God. It is beyond the scope of this rather limited study to actually define this kingdom. We do uh, believe, however, that it is a literal kingdom on earth called by Daniel the Stone Kingdom. Now we see in verse 34, verse 34 of Daniel 2, Daniel 2, verse 34 and 35. Um, Stephen, you want to read that? Sure. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, so we see here that, just going in reverse here, that we're seeing that there's this great image in the stone kingdom smote the feet, smote the feet, which caused the whole, you know, if you nail somebody's feet, obviously they're going to collapse, right? You take out their feet from them, the whole body, the whole image comes down. Now we see right here that these are kingdoms. The gold, which would be referred to Babylon. Then going back, then you'd have silver, which would be the Medo-Persian. Then you'd have the brass, which would be the uh, um, the, which be Greece. And then you have uh, iron mixed with the clay. And that's where you have the, um, the Roman Empire, pagan and then the papal. And it was divided into two sections and it has strengths, but also where the clay is, it has weaknesses. But it says in the middle of this kingdom, what are you going to have? You're going to have the stone kingdom established. And you see what's going on is you see like, for example, the British Isles and America, um, by the destiny of God, I mean, it's, this has been a Protestant country. That's the reason why we have the freedoms. Now, now, we have a wicked government. I'm not here to diminish that. But it's also important to understand God's sovereignty, okay? Now, he's put forth his sovereignty. And so... Understand that this is a battle going on, a battle. And so Daniel's interpretation of this was, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it the kingdom shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Daniel 2, 44. Okay. So Jesus spoke of it also in Matthew 21, verses 43 to 44. 43 says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. It would be given to a Christian nation. And verse 44, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now, Jesus quoted, Jesus was quoted um, David in Psalm 
37, verse 11, in his Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom. Matthew 5, 5. There are those who derive a great but false comfort in the belief that we are destined to live in heaven forever. But Jesus prayed, Thy kingdom come, in order that God's will will be done, what? On earth as it is in heaven. Remember, there's only heaven and earth, folks. Where's the kingdom coming from? It's coming from heaven and it's coming down to earth, right? Remember, there's only heaven and earth, mm -hmm. okay? Now, this plane is not destined for destruction. It is going to be shaken and cleansed so that God can give his people a good and beautiful inheritance. Remember, God's going to establish a new heaven and new earth. God himself found this in the days of Moses. Numbers 14 verse 21 states, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Remember in Revelation 21, verse 23, we're talking about there will be no need for the two great lights, which is the sun and moon and the stars, because Jesus Christ, God, the Father, and the Son are one. John 10, verse 30, the Lamb of God will be our light. And everything is about light, folks. That's what right. we see is because of light. We can only see a very small percept, uh, perspective of light. Mm -hmm. X-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, that's all part of the spectrum of light, okay? And light can be very powerful, folks. God, light can be very destructive. All right, so we see here that this vital truth that the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth has two or three witnesses required to establish it as truth. Two other prophets quote Moses' statement in Isaiah 11, verse 9, and Habakkuk 2, verse 14. Those who will rule with Christ in the kingdom will be where? Playing a harp up on a cloud in heaven? What? His kingdom's coming from where? It's coming from heaven mm -hmm. down to earth. Okay? I know, it's, it's, we've been told a lot of lies, folks. But thy kingdom, just say the Lord's Prayer. Our Amen. Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? So, we see here that uh, Revelation 5, verse 10. Those who will rule with Christ in the kingdom will be on earth as well. Uh, and has made us, made us unto earth our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Many Christians have also misread John 14, 1 through 3. This passage does not contradict Revelation 21. Christ went away to prepare the kingdom for us from his exalted and powerful position in heaven. He is cleansing the kingdom now, as he, as he could not do as man on earth. It was essential Jesus leave and be reinstated as king and priest and intercessor for the saints. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit, right, to us. We're God's temple. Now, John 14, verse 3 says, And if I, which is Christ, go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Where? He's coming again. He's coming to earth, right? And receive you unto myself, that where I am, that is in the kingdom on earth, mm -hmm. that he has just returned to, there ye may be also. John 14, verse 3. For his saints and with his saints. All right, so let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. My brother Stephen, you want to look at 1 Thessalonians? Yeah. 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, now... All right, now we're going to get in Scripture. We're going to start going back and forth, okay? Now, what did it say right there? When he comes, did you know that the dead will be... What, what's it saying right here? It's saying that with the trump of God, the voice of the archangel, um, it's going to say the dead in Christ shall rise first. first. Mm -hmm. So we got dead arising, mm -hmm. being resurrected, right? 
Well, that's not a secret rapture, folks. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's right there, folks. Yeah. That's just the beginning, folks. And if you look at that cross-reference, we're looking at Matthew 24, 30, folks. Matthew 24, 30 is going to talk about this. Um, Matthew 24, 30 states clearly that and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Once again, it's all about Him coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He shall send His angels with a great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds, or from the four corners, from one end of heaven to the other. Okay? So that's gathering the dead. Yeah. Okay? So we see here. And there's more references back and forth. Now let's just move forward here. Now rapturists also argue that Christ will first come for his saints, taking them in the rapture to heaven, and then later coming with his saints back to earth. But as a reader will notice, this passage says nothing about Christ coming for his saints in the sense of merely being taken into heaven. It merely says that uh, we will meet him Meet the Lord in the air, right? We're going to meet the Lord in the air. If I go to the airport to meet a brother, one would expect me to bring the brother home with me. One would certainly not expect me to get on the airplane and go with him. If I'm going to meet somebody at the airport, I don't get on the airplane and go with them, okay? He's coming in motion to the earth from heaven. So we meet him up in the air, which is kind of cool, and then we're up there, and then we're coming down with him and that opportunity to kick some butt, to conquer with his glory, this wicked government, and to subdue Satan's system. Okay? That's exciting. All right, so in the same way, when we go to meet Christ, we will bring him home to earth as the king of kings brought into the new Jerusalem to reign. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no reason to believe that we will all go to heaven with Christ when he returns. The scriptures do not tell us that Christ will come for his saints. The second passage that the rapturists use is Jude 14 verse 15. Jude 14 verse 15. You want to read that one, Stephen? Yeah. Jude 14 and 15. And 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Okay, so we see here that when he comes, he's going to be coming with 10,000 of his saints. That's a lot of saints, folks. And that's also going to be angels, too. He's coming with an angelic host, okay? Now... Is saying that Jude informs us that he is quoting Enoch here. Enoch's statement in context is found in the first chapter of the book of Enoch. Although this book is not a part of our Bible in its present form, Jude obviously agreed with its teaching on this issue. So let us quote part of the first chapter of Enoch and allow the context to interpret Jude's quotation of this book. Quote, the word of the blessings of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angel showed me, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one which is for to come. The Holy Great One will come forth from His dwelling, that's in heaven, folks, mm -hmm. and the eternal God will tread down the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and behold, He cometh with 10,000 of His saints, of His holy ones, to execute judgment upon all, and to destroy all the ungodly. 
You want to talk about rapture? It's going to be a rapture of the wicked. Mm -hmm. He's going to round them up and throw them in the fire. Amen. Okay? Now, this is actually did occur on Mount Sinai, as Moses says in Deuteronomy 33, 2. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them, which is Israel. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with 10,000 of his saints. So we have a reference there. So we see here that thus we see from Scripture that Christ came with 10,000 of saints at Mount Sinai and will come again in like manner. We've got yeah. the first coming, then we have the second coming, folks. One, two. This math is not difficult, folks. All right. And so the army of holy ones or saints does not refer to raptured Christians, but to his chosen people, Israel and earth, okay? And your Abraham's seed, how? When you're in Christ, right? We found that in Galatians uh, 3, verse 16, Abraham's seed. All right, so Enoch makes it very plain that the Christians will be living in the day of tribulation. The pre-tribulation rapture doctrine is foreign not only to the scriptures, but even to Enoch, which Jude quotes as his authority. Who then comprises the army of saints? The armies of heaven. Revelation 19, verse 14 speaks of the armies which were in heaven that will come with Christ to destroy the wicked. Paul describes these armies in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with and his mighty angels. mighty angels. Okay? We might conclude then that the word saint may refer to things or beings other than Christians as well. Okay? All right, so a good concordance will reveal that when you're talking about saints. It can be hagios in the Greek. It literally means sacred. So it can refer to angels as well. All right. Holy Ghost is another aspect of holy, saint, and also hagios can also mean holy, which could be referred to Holy Ghost, Holy City, Holy Covenant. For example, Holy City in Matthew 27, 53, or Holy Covenant, Luke 1, 72, or Holy Angels, Luke 9, 26. We may definitely say then that the word for saint simply means holy ones. That's what it means. Something that is sacred or consecrated. It may refer to Christians, but it is used in reference to many other holy things, including angels. Yes. Okay. We conclude then that the saints with whom Christ will come will be the angels of God as described by Paul in 2 Thessalonians. We've got 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Read verse 8, 9, 10. And in the flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Okay, so we see here that, yeah, quite, quite, uh, everything's confirming, folks. That's what the scriptures are saying back and forth. This is all about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, we're talking about uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we're talking about chapter 4, and we got to the very end. Um, and this was basically comforting one another because they were very zealous mm -hmm. and they were thinking that Jesus coming right away. You know, this is 54 AD, okay? This is 54 AD, folks. So a lot of times people have been saying a lot of false prophecy has destroyed a lot of lives, okay? So don't deal in free, fear. They're saying, Paul's going, work! Or you don't eat! Yeah, they're saying, oh, oh uh, second coming's coming, you know, so we not not even prepare. And also their loved ones are saying, look, you're going to see your loved ones in the kingdom when he comes. When he brings his kingdom from heaven to earth, you're going to see him. It's okay. You're going to see him. And that's comforting to me, you know, for my for my lost ones that I have that I've lost. So and for others. So what we see here, but we see that, but watch Stephen, you want to read chapter uh, five. Okay. 
Um, one through four. One through four. But the times of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Okay, so it's important for us to pay attention. Now, uh, when we're talking about a thief, a thief isn't something like really secret, okay? This is a violent period, folks. Now, that's what's talking about as a woman in... It's talking about a thief in the night, which you can... I'm going to have you reference 2 Peter uh, 3, verse 10. Okay. As a reference here, talking about a thief in the night. Now, when it says, they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them, mm -hmm. okay? This is a violent time. This isn't something secretly rapturing everybody's going to know. Sun destruction's coming on the wicked. As a woman travailing in birth, when she's in labor, that isn't something like... Yeah. No, it's like, ah, pain, okay? It's something very tumultuous, okay? Why don't you read 2 Peter 3, verse 10? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Okay, so, uh, hello, that, that's, that's the heaven and earth burning up, okay? That's what's going on. So we're going to pick it up next time. But remember, come to Jesus. Jesus loves you. Thank you.